All right, welcome everybody to the first Grand Rounds of the season and the first uh, partially in-person Grand Rounds. Um, for those of you who are on Zoom, we have a small but very mighty audience here and it's only 12.01. Um, so we're still hoping, oh yeah, people are still trickling in. Um, we're also hoping um, that soon we'll be able to allow food uh, again in here. That will, I'm sure, help with the in-person um, uh, attendance here. Um, but it is, uh, uh, it's really actually a great pleasure to see some people, just real life people again. So, uh, and it's a great honor to have this first one dedicated to the Grumbach Award uh, winner. Uh, Steve Gittleman, who unfortunately could not be here in person with us, is visible on the screen to us here in the audience and is going to do a little bit of an introduction before we hand it over to our speaker for today. Well, hello everyone. I am sorry, I can't be there in person today. I uh, uh, had the, the nice fortune of my wife uh, traveling to Europe and bringing uh, COVID home as a, a souvenir for our family. So um, I will uh, do this virtually and keep everyone there healthy. And um, uh, I am the, the chair of the Grumbach Award Committee. And um, this is our 34th annual uh, uh, award uh, recipient today. And I thought I'd use this time to talk a little bit about the past of our department and make sure everyone knows who Mel Grumbach was. Uh, and then we'll talk some about this year's winner. Um, so um, Dr. Grumbach uh, was a, a, a mentor and inspiring, and inspiring for, for many for, of for us. Many. Sorry, I'm getting an echo now, but hopefully you can hear me okay. So, uh, you know, in some ways he was like, the Steph Curry of his time. Uh, he uh, made a lot of seminal observations and contributions to the world of pediatric endocrinology and got all kinds of uh, awards and notoriety for that. Uh, but beyond his own uh, significant contributions as a physician scientist, he was uh, like the Steve Kerr. Um, you know, he uh, was uh, an inspiring coach and leader. And um, I, this was manifest in part by a number of the different leadership uh, positions he had over the years. But I'd like to highlight the fact that he was the chair of this department for 20 years and uh, remained in an emeritus position for many years thereafter. So he had a relationship with this department and, and really built this department uh, to what it is today over a 50 year period. Um, so really quite an inspiring figure. Um, and his role as this coach and leader, I think, is highlighted by where uh, some of the fellows went who, who graduated from our, our training program. And you can see the listings here, 40 chiefs of pedi pediatric endocrine divisions around the world, 13 department chairs, two deans. So really quite a legacy that he left. And um, so in his honor, one of the great things that we've done is to try and um, select the fellow that's made the largest contribution uh, during their training, uh, fellowship training period in research. And here are the members of the committee who have uh, been on this a number of years with me, and it has nice representation across the different divisions uh, with great support from the uh, administrative uh, people in the, in the department. And I think one of the challenges for our committee every year is it's just inspiring to see how much great work is being done by the fellows in basic translational and or clinical research. And so uh, the challenge for us is a lot of times we're trying to pick between apples and oranges when we select a single winner each year. Um, I wanted to recognize uh, the other nominees this year uh, who did not receive the award, um, who are all doing uh, great work and um, have, have very bright futures ahead of them. And then I wanna move on to this year's winner uh, and that's Marie Corrali uh, Cornette. And just to tell you a little bit about her, um, she was uh, raised in Belgium where she completed her undergraduate degree, her MD and pediatric residency training. And then she slowly started heading west. She first had a year of neonatal fellowship training at University College in London. And then she received a prestigious award from the Belgian American Education Foundation 
fellowship uh, in 2016 to study seizures in neonates at UCSF under the mentoring of Dr. Roberta Cilio. And she continued on in her research here uh, in neonatal seizures and encephalopathy with mentoring from uh, a number of the, the great faculty in this area uh, in our department, Donna Ferraro, for Fernando Gonzalez, and Yvonne Wu, uh, most notably. Um, uh, in 2021, she received the UCSF Newborn Brain Research Institute Award to investigate risk factors for neonatal encephalopathy and the Thrasher Early Career Award to study the impact of SSRI exposure in utero on neonatal outcomes. She's since joined our faculty. She's received a K-23 to further study the risk factors for neonatal encephalopathy and seizures. And um, one very exciting aspect of her work is she's going to build on a large cohort of neonates from Kaiser to analyze the role of maternal chorioamnionitis on neonatal outcomes that include encephalopathy, seizures, and neurodevelopment. So the title of her talk is shown here, Neonatal Seizures and Encephalopathy, Moving Beyond a One-Size-Fits-All Approach. And I will pass it over to Marie. Thank you, Dr. Gittleman, for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to make my slides appear on the screen. Yeah, yes. and then back in the microphone. And it sounds like it's working. Beautiful. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. It's my great honor to be here today to present my work and research um, that I did during fellowship. Um, and uh, today I'll be talking about encephalopathy and seizure in neonates. This is a really important topic because it's responsible for a lot of mortality and morbidities in our neonates and then children. Um, and I'm very excited to share with you all the results and the work that we've done. I have no conflict of interest. Um, and today I, I hope to um, demonstrate that encephalopathy and seizure are clinical manifestation of a multiple of different processes. And I focus on under-recognized causes of neonatal encephalopathy and seizure um, using two examples. The first one is the SSRI exposure in utero and how it can affect our neonates. And then the second one is more looking at the genetic epilepsies and how we can recognize them early if we pay attention to clinical signs. And really the, the goal of this presentation is to show you that by looking at clinical signs and by analyzing the etiology of seizure and encephalopathy, we can move toward a more personalized medicine approach. But first I'd like to talk about um, baby that I encountered in the NICU and I'm gonna call him Liam. Um, this baby was born from a healthy mother, 30 year old. It was a second pregnancy and the mom has anx had anxiety and was treated with acetalopram, which is a type of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor or SSRI. Um, otherwise the pregnancy was completely normal. She had normal scans. And then um, at 37 weeks and three days, she developed preeclampsia and it was recommended that she undergo um, induction of labor and she was started on magnesium. So pretty uneventful pregnancy. Um, her labor was a little bit prolonged, but it was an induction of labor. Um, she had category two tracing at the end of the, the labor uh, with some moderate variability, uh, but still some acceleration. There were some lead D cells, nothing outside of the scope of what is commonly seen in labor. And the baby was born by vaginal delivery. Um, and was unexpectedly born in poor condition. And so the neonate were, the neonatologists were batch paged and um, the baby required PPV and then was transferred to the NICU because he still needed CPAP after 10 minutes. And so when babies are admitted to the neonatal unit after needing significant resuscitation, um, what we always do is we assess their neurological status um, to see whether they would need further treatment. Um, and in this case, the baby had 
was hyper alert, uh, but had normal spontaneous activity. His posture wasn't totally normal for a term newborn. Um, he was just partially flexed with uh, his uh, arm extended, um, and he was a little bit hypertonic, but nothing really um, else that was remarkable. And so when you have three abnormal findings on your, on your normal, on your neonatal neuro neurologic exam, this is what we call mild encephalopathy. Um, and neonatal encephalopathy affect about one in four per thousand neonates in developed country. It's much more common in developing countries. Um, but the epidemiology of neonatal encephalopathy really is not very well described. Um, and as you can see, the most paper that describe the incidence of neonatal encephalopathy come from studies that were done even two decades ago. Um, and and um, neonatal encephalopathy is defined as an abnormal level of consciousness, difficulty initiating or maintaining respiration, and then um, sometimes can be associated with an abnormal tone or reflexes in the first few hours after birth. Sometimes it's associated with seizure and the consequences, the long-term consequences vary a lot based on etiology and also based on the severity. Uh, when we think about the cause of neonatal encephalopathy, many causes have been described. The most commonly studied are encephalopathy that are due to an acute perinatal event. That's what we call HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, where a lack of blood flow or oxygen to the brain leads to the encephalopathy. But many other causes exist, and we don't really know how these causes impact outcome. So what I wanted to study was really the incidence of neonatal encephalopathy, what were the risk factors, and then how would that affect management and outcomes. To do that, I um, was funded by the Newborn Brain Research Institute here in UCSF, and we did a large population-based study with the aim of describing the incidence of neonatal encephalopathy um, in a modern US cohort, and then to identify risk factors. Um, we included all neonates that were born at 35 weeks or after um, between 2011 and 2019 among 15 Kaiser Permanent in Northern California Hospital. And we excluded the mother that were not involved in KP during their pregnancy. And that's because we didn't have any ex um, information on exposure and on, on uh, risk factors. And then in all these infants in the cohort, we identified the presence of neonatal encephalopathy. And we defined neonatal encephalopathy as having an abnormal neurologic exam between one and six hours of life, and then having at least one of these, either the exam remains abnormal after six hours, or the baby is treated with therapeutic hypothermia, or the baby has seizure in the first 24 hours after birth. And what's great about the Kaiser um, uh, medical record is that every time a baby is born with an APGAR score less than seven at five minutes of life or has acidosis after birth on cord, um, the neonatologist or the pediatrician are prompted to do a um, um, standardized neurologic exam. And that standardized exam is documented in a chart and contains all the components of the SARNET exam, which is really helpful to assess how the baby is doing after birth. In total, we reviewed a little bit more than 2,000 charts. Um, we reviewed all babies that had an abnormal neurologic exam to confirm the anomalies and the duration. And then we reviewed all babies that were at higher risk of having encephalopathy, either because they had uh, perineal depression, acidosis, they died, um, or they had a, an ICD code or a discharge diagnosis of, for HIE or seizure they receive specific medicine or therapeutic hypothermia. So we did a lot of chart review to identify neo, uh, neonates with encephalopathy. And then we extracted predictors from the EHR, um, including demographics, maternal diagnosis, some pharmacy data, labor and infant data. And after this chart review, we identified 722 neonates with neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, and so that gives us an incidence in California of 2.4 per thousand infants having neonatal encephalopathy. Um, among them, seven and a half percent, so 54, had congenital anomalies or genetic condition that were explaining the encephalopathy. Those were chromosomal anomalies, neuromuscular disorders, 
brain, brain malformation or genetic diseases. Um, and then we had a group of 668 where there was no identified genetic etiology to the encephalopathy. And for those baby, we looked at the risk factors for encephalopathy. We first looked at demographics, and you can see that compared to white infants, um, Hispanic babies um, or mother that were Hispanic had less risk of having a baby with neonatal encephalopathy. Um, and then other than that risk factor that are already well described for neonatal encephalopathy were, were in liparity. So when it's the first baby, it's a higher risk of having neonatal encephalopathy when the baby is born either early or late, when the baby is small or very large. And then babies that are boys, baby boys, tend to have more encephalopathy. When we looked at maternal comorbidities, we, look, we see that long-term medical conditions such as type 2 diabetes and chronic hypertension both increase the risk of having neonatal encephalopathy. And then things that happen a little bit later during pregnancy, preeclampsia, like um, the mom in our case, or chorioamnionitis, increase a lot the risk of having neonatal encephalopathy. But what I, what I was really interested in looking at is that mothers that have mental health diseases are at increased risks of having neonatal encephalopathy. And then the mothers that are treated with SSRI, which is a common treatment for depression and anxiety, also are at increased risk of neonatal encephalopathy. And I wanted to see whether the SSRI was, were responsible for the increased risk or whether it was the the um, underlying maternal mental health disorder. If we go back to our baby Liam, he had no signs of HIE. He had um, no acidosis on his cord gas or infant gas. And despite having encephalopathy, he wasn't cool because he wasn't meeting criteria. But we were thinking that maybe SSRI were part of the explanation of his neurologic um, presentation. And so um, I got funded by the Trasher Research Fund to study that question about how SSR rise and maternal mental health disorder can affect uh, the neonatal adaptation. And this is a really important question because about one in five pregnant women is diagnosed with depression or anxiety. And these numbers are from pre-COVID. So with COVID, the numbers are much higher. Some studies that are coming out now report that 50% of pregnant women do fail criteria for being either depressed or anxious. Um, and about one in 20 pregnant women is treated with SSRI in the US. Um, both mental health disorder and SSRI are associated with poor outcomes, both in the mother and in the baby. Um, these can be um, respiratory distress syndrome, um, can be poor neonatal adaptation with low ABGOR score, like we saw in baby Liam. And then there was one study that was published three years ago that showed that babies that had, um, among babies treated with therapeutic hypothermia, um, the prevalence of being exposed to SSRI was much higher than in babies that were not treated with SSRI, raising the question about whether those babies that are exposed at are increased risk of being treated with therapeutic hypothermia. The problem with all those studies is that either they were very small or they were unable to adjust for important confounder, such as the maternal mental health condition. And so in uh, this study, we asked whether SSRI exposure in the third trimester of pregnancy was associated with neonatal encephalopathy and whether that was independent of maternal mental health diseases. And then we looked at a, a um, couple of other secondary outcome such as delayed adaptation, admission to the NICU, seizures, and HIE. Our exposure was um, being exposed to SSRI in the third trimester for at least one day. And what's great with Kaiser is that um, most mother that receive prescription through Kaiser get it through Kaiser permanent pharmacies. And so we were able to extract data on um, medicine that were dispensed. Um, and we extracted the type of SSRI that was prescribed, the duration of the treatment, which dose they were on, and then we converted all the dose into sertraline equivalent to look at um, those response relationship. And this is uh, our first results. So in this large cohort, uh, we again have um, 295,000 um, 
birth, and then about 760 had congenital anomalies and were excluded from this study because we knew that their encephalopathy, if they had it, was not uh, was due to their congenital anomaly. Um, and when keeping only babies without congenital anomaly or, or genetic anomaly, um, we had 2.6% of the cohort that was exposed to SSRI in the third trimester, which is a little bit lower than what is described in the literature, um, probably because we included only mother that were exposed in the third trimester. When looking at all mothers, uh, it was 3.3%. All um, exposure in, at any point during pregnancy was 3.3% of the mother. Um, and then among babies that were exposed to SSRI, uh, the risk of encephalopathy was doubled. Um, so 4.4 uh, per thousand babies had encephalopathy. But as we discussed before, the mother that are on SSRI are very different from the non-SSRI non users. Um, and here you can see that compared to white uh, mother, the um, mother that are um, describing themselves as Hispanic uh, or black have, are treated twice less um, and the Asian mother are uh, eight times less likely to get treated with SSRI. Uh, so there is big variations. Um, and then mother that have any um, maternal or pregnancy comorbidities were at higher risks of being treated with SSRIs. And so we adjusted for our analysis for a potential confounder. And when uh, this is the result of our logistic regression, um, and when adjusting for maternal mental health condition, um, as well as other um, demographics and comorbidities that have been associated with risk of having neonatal encephalopathy, um, we can see that SSRI exposure in the third trimester is still associated with an increased risk of having neonatal encephalopathy. Um, and so babies um, exposed to SSRI have um, 1.6 times the odds of having neonatal encephalopathy independent of the maternal mental health condition. And what's also really interesting is that depression is not significant anymore. And so it doesn't look like depression is responsible for the encephalopathy, but rather the treatment. Um, we then wanted to look at the severity of neonatal encephalopathy and whether those babies were having the same types of severity that um, we see in our neonates. Um, and we see that SSRI do increase the risk of mild encephalopathy, but not moderate to severe, which is important because moderate to severe encephalopathy leads to much more adverse outcome. And then the other thing that's important is that neonatal encephalopathy is very rare. And so you have to treat a lot of mother to have one extra case of neonatal encephalopathy. And when, when you look at the risk difference, you can um, then assess the number needed to harm if we assume causality and it's about a thousand, which is just a lot of mother, it means that a, a thousand mother would need to be treated with SSRI to have one extra case of neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, we also looked at timing, dose and type of SSRI and uh, showed that when you're exposed before the third trimester, there's no increased risks of neonatal encephalopathy. Low dose wasn't either associated with increased risk of neonatal encephalopathy. And then, um, Mothers that were on sertraline monotherapy, which is the majority of our mothers, um, were not at increase at significantly uh, statistically significantly increased risk of having neonatal encephalopathy. However, um, that is probably because those mothers on sertraline were on low dose. Um, and when we stratified a little bit further and looked at high dose sertraline, there was um, an association between high dose sertraline and neonatal encephalopathy. Um, in terms of secondary outcome, we confirmed that neonates exposed to SSRI are at increased risk of having low outdoor score, um, requiring PPV at birth and uh, needing to be admitted to the ICN. Um, and because that's much more common, the number needed to harm is much lower. Um, and so this is important for pediatricians who um, are attending deliveries um, because you want to know that these babies may require help much more often than others. Uh, and specifically, they may, they may need PPV two, three times more often than, um, than unexposed infants. So in conclusion, 
uh, SSRI in the third trimester was associated with mild encephalopathy, low five-minute ABGOR scores, and admission to the ICN, but it wasn't associated with more severe outcomes such as moderate to severe encephalopathy, seizure, or HIE requiring therapeutic hypothermia. And then um, when we look at the risk for encephalopathy, if SSRIs are given before the third trimester, it's low dose or it's sertraline, and for sure sertraline low dose, this wasn't associated with increased encephalopathy. And so it raised really the question of whether um, the, the balance between the risks and benefits of treatment, um, knowing that there is an increased risk of mild neonatal encephalopathy, but also an increased risk for needing resuscitation, but the long-term effect remains unknown. And there's certainly a lot of benefits to treating mothers with men who have mental health disorders um, as it improves um, bonding, breastfeeding, familial interaction, and all those things could be important for the infant as well. And so um, the next steps will be to see what is the impact of low dose sertraline, which is um, the treatment taken by, by the majority of um, our mothers on other neonatal outcomes and then to study the long-term side effects of SSRI exposure in utero. The other thing that we want to do is to try and differentiate those babies that have HIE from the one that are SSRI exposed, um, because we want to avoid overtreatment with therapeutic hypothermia. And it looks like there is a lot of variation between centers among who gets treated with therapeutic hypothermia, and those infants may be at risk in some centers. Um, and then the last thing is that um, while we showed that there was no increased risk of seizure um, in neonates exposed to SSRI, this is, this is a little bit different than what has been shown in the past. And it's probably because we use a stricter definition of seizure. My second research interest is neonatal seizure. And so when we looked at all the chart, we also defined this, the, uh, um, the likelihood of seizure in each, in, in each infant. Um, and we considered a seizure, only seizure that were either confir confirmed on EEG or um, that had specific clinical findings. Um, in the case of our baby Liam, when he was admitted, he, um, because he had mild encephalopathy, he was monitored and then he, he had those movements um, that were questionable. Uh, so you can see those posturing events um, and people were really worried about seizure in him um, and whether he should need, he should get treatment for seizures. Um, so you can see those kind of repetitive tonic posturing. Um, this is an algorithm that I really like to assess whether or not it's a seizure. Um, in UCSF, we have the luxury of having EEG available right away, but that's not the case everywhere. And so looking at the semiology of seizure is important to, to assess whether or not this baby is at high risk of having a seizure. Um, and it's considered that when the movements are either focal clonic or focal tonic, then it's a probable seizure. Uh, but otherwise, um, it is considered either no seizure or possible seizure, and those events should probably not be treated without EEG confirmation. In this case, we had an EEG and there were no seizure on the EEG, so the baby wasn't treated. But non-epileptic events can really look like seizure, and seizure can be difficult to recognize, and so we need EEG to uh, make a diagnosis. And this is very parallel to the study that I did uh, just before this study, looking at other unrecognized causes of seizure, such as the genetic epilepsies. Um, this study was funded by the Belgian American Educational Foundation and looked at, um, at recognizing the electroclinical presentation of seizure to assess etiology. Seizure um, incidence is about one to three per thousand neonates, a, a little bit the same as encephalopathy, and it leads to a little bit the same um, type of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment and risk of death as neonatal encephalopathy. Um, about one in five seizures are due to rare uh, structural or genetic condition, but most seizure in neonates are what we call acute provoked, meaning that there is an acute event around the time of birth, such as HIE, where there is a lack of blood flow or oxygen, a stroke or an infection that causes a seizure. And what I wanted to 
And what we will look at is how to recognize those babies that have the rarer condition that creates seizures, such as the genetic epilepsies. And I'm gonna show you why this is so important to recognize. And this is a baby that I'm gonna call Orla. Um, she was born to a healthy mother. The labor and pregnancy were unremarkable. Uh, mom had a diagnosis of choreo at the very end of labor, and then the baby had ABRA score of five and nine. She went to well baby uh, and what was doing um, overall fine. But then around 28 hours of life, she had an episode of cyanosis and abnormal movement. Um, she was examined by the pediatrician at that time and remained in well baby. Two hours later, she had the same event again. The mom described that she became really blue, uh, was very scared, and so she brought, was brought to the ICN for EEG monitoring. And this is the event that was noted. You can see this cry that is a little bit suspicious, and then the tonic posturing that is very asymmetric. Um, and then she remains very tonic. So you can see how different this seizure is compared to the abnormal movement that we saw earlier. Here you have the asymmetric tonic posturing. Baby is so tonic that he lifts his um, legs from the bed, and then he's becoming blue because he's not breathing anymore. And the seizure is pretty short. Um, because by um, around, no, the seizure is uh, finished on EEG. Um, so it's a short seizure, but a pretty dramatic presentation. Um, and so that was, um, the seizure were confirmed on EEG um, and she was treated with phenobarbital, which is our common treatment for neonatal seizure. She got an MRI that was normal but then she continued to have seizures. And so at that point, um, the question was raised of whether it was a genetic epilepsy. Um, and I think it was raised really early and often it takes weeks to month to make this, to have the suspicion of a genetic epilepsy. And that allowed this baby to get treated with a targeted uh, therapy, which is carbamazepine and then the seizure stopped. Uh, but very often these babies um, do continue to cease for a long time. Um, the genetic um, screening was sent immediately and it, she was identified to have a KCNQ2 pathogenic variant, um, which is the most common because of genetic epilepsies in neonates. Um, and again, this diagnosis was done so early that she was discharged by day of life seven without even having the diagnosis. Uh, she had no more seizure after that. And so it's so important to uh, make that diagnosis early to avoid a long hospital stay uh, and then a, a series of tests that are not needed. And so what we wanted to do was look at all these babies that have genetic anomalies and see how they differ from the babies that have acute provoked seizures. To do that, we had two cohorts, a cohort with um, neonates that had early onset epilepsies and then a cohort of newborn that had acute provoked seizure. Um, we looked at the charts and the video EEG and we defined the semiology of seizure. And just to give you an example um, of uh, the type of seizure that we were looking at on video, there were re reviewed videos of seizure for all the babies. And here you can see a tonic sequential seizure. So it looks very similar to the previous seizure that you've seen uh, where the baby is having this tonic posturing. It's also asymmetric. Um, but then after that, the baby, and the baby is also becoming blue and um, is not breathing. Um, but then after that, the baby starts having those clonic jerks here. And so this is what we call tonic sequential. And this seizure was again, quite short, about a minute and a half. Um, this is a clonic seizure and it's also a good illustration for our trainee that it's really hard to pick up those seizure. When you look at this baby, you have to be really careful. And then you can see that the hand is having those clonic 
repetitive movement. And we have a few videos where the neurologist or the pediatrician is examining the baby um, and doing the whole neurologic exam with the baby having the clonic movement of the hand and no one noticing it because it's subtle and babies are not like adults. They're not a big size. And when an adult is having a seizure, you can see it. But here, um, it's much harder to notice and that's why we need the monitoring. And then the other types of seizure is here a baby with myoclonic seizures. So you can see that um, these are much more rapid than the clonic seizure. So it's a very rapid shock-like muscle contraction. It lasts less. And then a common type of seizure in neonates is electrographic only seizure where the baby is doing nothing. And so the video is not very interesting. The baby is just breathing. Nothing is happening, but the baby is seizing on EEG. And this is about 50% of the seizure that we see in, our, in neonates with acute provoked seizures. So in this study, we had 20 infants with um, proven neonatal onset genetic epilepsy. 18 of them had channel obtis, and then two had cell signaling disorder uh, associated with BRAT1 um, anomalies. When we compared infants with genetic epilepsies and acute provoked seizure, the one with genetic epilepsies had um, more often a family history. They tended to have refractory seizure and they tended to have tonic seizures. Uh, when we looked at the seizure semiology, very interestingly, all babies with channelopathy mostly had tonic seizure, while a baby with stroke uh, most often had clonic seizures. In HIE babies, half of them had a subclinical or electrographic only seizure, and then the remainder had either clonic or myoclonic seizure. And then our two babies with BRAT1 uh, pathogenic variant both had uh, myoclonic seizures. When we look at age of onset, um, it's often thought that babies that have genetic epilepsies tend to uh, present later. Um, but the one that had the most severe type of genetic epilepsies, the one that had um, epilepsies that went on to uh, develop um, developmental disorder, um, presented at the same age as babies with HIE and stroke. And so this is not an exclusion. Uh, and, and the age at onset is, is not a good sign of whether it's an acute provoked seizure or genetic epilepsy. And then the, there is a signature for at least the KCNQ2 variants where the EEG and the AEG looks quite different uh, between the one that have acute provoked seizure and the one with KCNQ2. And you can see that, um, so here you have a normal, background on the AEEG, and then you have the seizure and then you come back to that background. Whereas in genetic epilepsy, you often have a very marked depression of the background that can last much longer than the seizure, which is very atypical in infant with acute provoked seizure. And so we describe that as well. In conclusion, really looking at the electroclinical phenotype may allow one to either identify the seizure etiology or at least to think about um, a genetic epilepsy and to send testing early. And this is essential to um, first discontinue medicine in babies that have acute seizure because they don't need to be treated very long. Often after three days, they're not seizing anymore and they can be discharged without any seizure medicine. The one that have genetic epilepsies and the one that have channelopathy um, are very responsive to carbamazepine. And so giving that treatment early allow for early discharge and may improve neurodevelopmental outcome. And then some babies have a more sad and um, difficult condition. And the two babies with BRAT1 evolved into um, apnea, bradycardia, and died before three months of life. And so having the diagnosis helps to consult the family and to do um, more uh, palliative care treatment. Um, given the rarity of those genetic epilepsy, it's gonna be really important to have large database with genotyping, standardized clinical phenotyping to help recognize them early. 
Um, and that's why I really enjoy working with the Kaiser database because they have so many babies and they have a ton of babies with genetic epilepsies as well. Some of them um, that are diagnosed when they are much older. And then I'm gonna spend the last two minutes talking about the next phase of my project, which is uh, looking at other risk factor for encephalopathy and focusing mostly on uh, inflammation and infection. Um, because, um, and so this is the maternal chorionitis and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy study, which is funded by the NICHD. Um, and the reason why I was interested in that is that Choreo is very common in our cohort. 7% of mother are diagnosed with choreo. Um, it is thought that uh, choreo decreased the fetal tolerance to labor. And so uh, there is an increased risk of having HIE after choreo. However, the animal studies show that in these babies that have um, infection, uh, in, in animal that are, are uh, infection or inflammation sensitized, therapeutic hypothermia is not uh, neuroprotective. And so I really wanted to study how choreo impacts the risk of HIE and then how it impacts the response to treatment with therapeutic hypothermia. The problem of choreo is that it is a really difficult diagnosis. And I'm not an obstetrician. Um, but there is a lot of, vari the, of variety in how it is diagnosed. There's the clinical chorioamnonitis that is sometimes called suspected chorioamnonitis um, that is somewhat subjective. And then there has been some um, uh, attempt to standardize the definition, um, but it's not widely used. Um, and that standardized definition requires the mother to have proven fever and then the baby needs to have fetal tachycardia or the mother needs to have leukocytosis or the amniotic fluid needs to be purulent. Um, and, and this definition, it is unknown how this definition affects the risk of HIE. And then there's the confirmed chorioamnionitis, which is the histologic confirmation. And, but that's only available a few days after the baby is born. Sometimes he's already discharged uh, and it correlates quite poorly with the clinical chorioamnionitis. And so there's a lot to untangle in those relationships. My goals will be to quantify the association between clinical choreo as defined by the NICHD and the risk of HIE, and then to look at neonates that were treated in the, with therapeutic hypothermia in our cohort and see how chorioamnionitis impact response to treatment and brain injury. And then I looked at longer term neurodevelopmental impairments. And so just to conclude with a few uh, important learning points, I think you wanna remember that neonatal encephalopathy and seizure are really signs of diseases. And those diseases are, are often complex and multifactorial. And so neonatal seizure is just not just one entity, neonatal encephalopathy is just not just one entity, but the etiology is really important to decide how you treat it. And it's exactly the same as fever. You're treating fever differently if it's a bacterial or viral infection. We need to have the same approach for neonatal seizure. We need to have the same approach for neonatal encephalopathy. Um, and, and therapeutic hypothermia is probably not a one size fit all and shouldn't be um, the treatment for all babies with neonatal encephalopathy. Uh, and so we need to, to be able to identify those subgroups that are gonna respond better to different types of therapy to improve outcome. And to do that, we need large databases or uh, collaboration between centers. I want to thank all my mentors and my primary mentor for this project is uh, Dr. Ivan, Ivan Wu, who is in the, the audience um, that I want to thank for all the guidance and mentoring because I definitely this award uh, is in large part thanks to her. Uh, and then Dr. Kusnovitz who works in Kaiser, Dr. Chilio who is back working in Belgium. Um, and was my mentor for the early stage of my research career in Dr. Newman. Uh, and then all the teams that are working um, with me on the Kaiser database and all the faculty um, and staff at uh, in neonatology at UCSF. Thank you. Dr. Gittleman is going to ask a few questions and then we'll open it to a question from the audience. Because we're over Zoom, I think it would be helpful to repeat questions that come from the audience in here. Dr. Gittleman, I'm going to ask you 
Gilman, are you there for us? Yes. yes. Can you hear me, Marie? Yes, I can hear yeah, you. That was, that was a beautiful talk, and um, uh, you outlined such a such a broad range of work and uh, such such important work. So congratulations, and uh, you you outlined a, you. a few decades of work to come, which we'll all be excited to see. <laughs> Um, one, one question I, you know, a lot of provocative things there. One question I had was just about the SSRI piece. Um, you know, presumably drugs are studied very carefully in animal models before they're approved for use, uh, particularly during pregnancy, and then there's surveillance post-approval. Um, have we just missed a potential link between SSRI and uh, uh, the issues you've outlined? Uh, what 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 do you think the, the the issue is there, and does that uh, suggest that you know our our screening for use of drugs during pregnancy is inadequate the way it stands? Thank you. That, those are really beautiful questions. I think the first part was more animal models, and it is very interesting that even the mechanism underlying SSRI toxicity. Um, so it's it's been studied and and well described that those infants have lower Apgar scores or, or can have poor neonatal adaptation, but the mechanism underlying that effect is not really well understood. Uh, SSRI do press the placenta, um, and so um, they can affect the newborn brains. It is possible that it is a toxic mechanism directly on the newborn brain, but it could also just be withdrawal because those symptoms are quite similar to the symptoms seen either in withdrawal or even in toxicity in adults that are taking SSRI and either discontinuing it or taking higher doses. Uh, and so this needs to be st studied further. Um, so in terms of mechanism, it is really hard and not well understood in the literature yet. Um, in terms of whether we've missed something and what is going on there, um, there's three points I think that are important. The first one is that there's never been any randomized controlled trial looking at SSRI treatment versus uh, non-pharmacologic treatment in mother that are depressed or anxious during pregnancy. So SSRI have been shown to be effective in mother that are not in, in adults uh, and in women, but not in pregnant women. Um, and when a mother is on SSRI, it is a very common treatment and it, it, it is hard to stop it. Um, and so um, this continuing SSRI during pregnancy is hard, and I think that's why it is so widely used. There has been some surveillance studies, and um, it looks like um, sertraline may be safer than the other SSRIs, um, but it is a balance between the risks and benefits, and it depends a little bit on who you talk with. And obstetricians are very, um, very clear that it is and, and even neonatology, that it is important for the mother to have well-controlled mental health disorder during pregnancy. And so you have to balance those risks and benefits. But I think um, having more data on safety is gonna be important for mothers and provider to make informed choices about continuing a treatment. Thank you. Do you have other questions? If not, I'm sure there's people in the audience. It, I, I can ask one more if there's uh, not an immediate question, Sandrine. Um, can you clarify the, gen the genetic evaluation? So did you have a panel of candidate genes you were looking at or was it kind of just a uh, you know, whole exome or whole genome type approach? And could you, if, if, it's, if it's a panel of genes, do you think you need a broader approach to really know if there are other genetic things that are being missed that might be linked with some of the outcomes you're studying? Yeah, so the genetic evaluation is tricky. Not all neonates do get genetic evaluation. So you have a biased sample. Um, the evaluation is for seizure, the recommendation is to do a panel first, but then to move on to an exome if the panel is negative. Um, because panel do catch most of the genetic epilepsy, but our first baby with BRAT1 um, had a panel that came back negative and then had, um, and then BRAT1 was identified by exome. Uh, 
um, because at that point, BRAT1 was not included in the panel. And since then, BRAT1 has been included in the panel. Uh, and that's the same case for another baby that is also included in the study that um, was screened for um, genetic epilepsy much earlier, I think in 2014, where that the panel was much more restrictive and then was found to have a CN2 a mutation afterwards. So yes, I think we, we still have a lot to learn with genetic diseases and there's new condition that, and new genes that are discovered every month. Luckily you're early in your career, so. Um, <laughs> um, Maria, I have a question for you. I was struck by the finding that um, there was lower rate of neonatal encephalopathy in mothers of Hispanic, um, uh, self-identified self as Hispanic background. And then, then later on, it seems like maybe that is because they're taking fewer SSRIs or high-dose SSRIs. And I was wondering, are we under-treating depression in certain groups or are we over-treating it in other groups or what's your thought on that? Uh, yeah, there's there's two questions there. Yeah. I think the first one is is hard to answer, and I think it's much more than just being treated with SSRI. The, the, this racial and ethnic difference, but in terms of disparities of treatment, it is fascinating. When you look at the um, so only thirty percent of mothers that have a diagnosis of um, depression or anxiety get treated with um, with um, SSRIs. And then uh, when we look at white women, they're much more likely to get treated. And, um, and the worst is our black mothers who, do, who, who are disproportionately affected by mental health disorders, but do not get treatment. Um, and so those mothers are the ones that have the higher likelihood of having a diagnosis of depression or anxiety, but do not get um, SSRI prescribed. And then among Asian women, um, there is very little diagnosis of depression or anxiety. And it is probably linked to a lot of cultural, social, and um, other factors. Uh, but then those mothers are uh, barely, are nearly never treated with SSRIs. And so there's a, there's a lot of um, social disparities uh, in the field, for sure. Other questions? Like, um, kind of a question or a comment and, and a follow up question. So first of all, like fantastic, uh, really fascinating talk and body of work that you're assembling here. Um, one, one thought is that you have the number needed to harm of one in a thousand, but you flip that the other way and it's the number of, if you were to take away the SSRI, you're harming potentially 999 mothers. Right, um, for not treating their, their depression. Um, so I think it's such a tricky area. But that then I think dovetails into Steve's question and thinking about like what the animal models are. Yeah. And so are there ideas that you can extrapolate based on animal models for some of the endpoints that you would want to look at for long-term follow-up areas that you think would be particularly susceptible from what we know happens in development or may happen in development? Um, that could help guide your clinical work going forward to see what, what the outcomes are uh, in patients who are exposed in utero. Yeah, so uh, the mothers that have mental health disorders, um, the, the infant of mother that have mental health disorder are at higher risk of neurodevelopmental impairment, ADHD, um, and, and a, a lot of neurologic comorbidities. And so we are going to look at ICD-9 code, which are not extremely uh, specific or sensitive, uh, but it, it's gonna, and we are gonna adjust in the same way that we are doing. So looking at SSRI exposure and then the maternal mental health disorder and see how, um, how we can entangle that relationship a little bit more. Um, but yeah, it is autism, ADHD, um, and then um, executive function. Um, the problem is that this is really hard to capture in a uh, medical record. Uh, I don't think we are going to see increase in more severe outcomes, such as CP, which is a little bit better coded, um, because it looks like it's more um, really the more executive function and um, 
behavioral regulation that may be affected if it is, but we'll see. So the question was, can the seizure be seen in utero before birth? Um, and in our units that had genetic epilepsies, um, some mother report that the movement of the babies were a little bit different than uh, in their other pregnancies, but there's no way to really diagnose um, seizure in utero. Um, and so I, I don't know of any mechanism where we would be certain that there is seizure or not. When you ask mom whether they felt hiccup, um, some studies say that when you feel a hiccup, it may be seizure, but having hiccup in having a baby with hiccup in pregnancy is very, very common. Um, and so there might be a bias in the way we ascertain that. And when we ask a mom who has a baby with epilepsy whether her baby has hiccup, she's much more likely to remember it than a mom whose baby is doing completely fine. Marie, can I ask you one more question from afar? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so you can't escape the Grumbach lecture without being asked an endocrine question. Um, so, <laughs> so, so one of the high risk factors I, I saw was for type 2 diabetes, right? Uh, and that's potentially modifiable. So I'd be curious if you've done an analysis where you've looked at the link between glycemic control during pregnancy and um, the neonatal outcomes. And, um, you know, we're, we're of course very concerned with the increased uh, 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 prevalence of type two, particularly amongst uh, young women and, and what that portends for pregnancy and, and outcomes. Yeah, it is a fascinating question. I'd love to look at that. What's interesting is that mother that have gestational diabetes, are not at increased risk of having a neonatal encephalopathy. So you would think that those are the ones that have kind of um, some dysregulation that happened really at the end of the pregnancy. And those were one are not at increased risk of having neonatal encephalopathy through the type two diabetes. So there's a lot to untangle there. Love to have your thoughts on how to do that. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve, for um, uh, being a moderator from afar. And the one nice thing about being in person is that I can actually congratulate you with some flowers and a card. Congratulations and thank you so much for Grand Valley. And there's only so And then the last thing I want to do, also because I want to take advantage, advantage of being in person, we would not have been able to have grand rounds throughout the pandemic in, in uh, virtual form and in blended forms with our the fantastic Cherise Masanuga. Cherise, come up front here for a moment and really take a small token of our appreciation for all your hard work. Thank you. To everyone on Zoom, as I mentioned, there's only a small group of people here and it's actually become smaller towards the end. But they're really cool people. So if you want to be part of the cool kids, come in person. Next week, there's no grand rounds because it's new faculty orientation day. But the week after, we're back here with Monica Gandhi uh, coming to give what promises to be a very interesting grand round postponed from last year about the history of pandemics and what that means for the current pandemic. So thank you all for joining. And uh, we'll hopefully be back with food too a little later this fall. So see you all soon.